They weren't even that big, but it was just that feeling of getting rolled around underwater. I'd always paddle out the back. But the thing was, once I was out there, I was stuck because I was too scared to turn around and catch a wave and get back to shore. That would be when my mum would have to swim out and get me, and at that age it's pretty much the most embarrassing thing that can happen for you. I guess it was that mentality of just making yourself do what the other guy was too scared to do. It stuck with me over the years. Eventually I got over my childhood fears. I felt pins and needles coming down my back. I was like, oh God, what have I done? The thought of losing to go to jail, I couldn't cut with that. I wasn't sure he could cut with that. The whole corner of my face was just hanging off. I thought he was going to break his arm for sure because it didn't look like Rich was going to tap. And... I had a great upbringing. My whole family surfed. My dad still calls me Nev after the first surfboard he bought me. I was only young when my parents split. And when they did split, I moved down the beach with my mum. And from that point on, I just spent every day in the surf. And that's when I met Richie. He just happened to be going through the exact same thing with his parents. My dad is from the Czech Republic. He moved out to Australia as a political refugee in the 70s. And that's where I met my mum, who was from Manchester, England. They met in Sydney and they got married and they started a family. And that's where myself and my sister grew up. At a young age, when I was 10, my parents split. My dad, he was a brewer by trade, so he obviously loved to drink. But, you know, often when he did, he'd get in an argument with my mum. There's, as a kid growing up, seeing your parents argue, when you know they had too much to drink, it was uh, it's pretty upsetting. and. You know, it kind of sticks with you too, so even though it never got violent or anything like that, it's just the constant arguments and stuff. You know, it was really sort of, you know, sucked as a kid to watch that. I continued to live with my mum, but my dad moved into an apartment at Maroo Beach. I guess in some way this kind of eased the pain of my parents splitting because I now had a house at the beach where I could leave my board and I had every excuse now just to spend all my time at the beach with my friends. It's probably like, though we didn't realise it when we were that young, but, you know, we had that sort of similar situation going on that probably brought us a bit closer together. I think it was a surf contest down the beach, also a skate contest, and uh, the surf shop put on a, a, a pie contest. The Australian pie is just like boiling hot, <laughs> and to try and eat it fast is just ridiculous. <laughs> He's always putting a show on for everyone, regardless of what he was doing. He could have everyone in stitches, and that's what everyone wanted to see, and everyone would egg him on, and it would just like create this little monster. <laughs> Mark was you know, a bit shy or a bit quieter than myself. Other kids, they're watching their heroes on TV, but for us, we were growing up with our heroes. It was that much more powerful. We were trying to impress our heroes who were right there with us. The older boys were making a living out of surfing big waves. Everyone saw the boys as being fearless in and out of the water. We didn't know at the time, but we were growing up with, you know, older surfers that were pretty much the craziest surfers in the world. And it felt normal to us because we'd been trying to keep up with guys that were going anything. Like if someone said to you, you know, you won't do it, or bet you you couldn't do it, you just do it to prove them wrong. That was like our motto growing up, is like, you, you won't. You won't. <laughs> so you'd do it in the surf, like the biggest wave of the day would come through, that there's just no way you can make. You won't. Yeah, and I'd just look at Rich and go, you won't go this bridge. And he'd just swing around and take off on it, like, regardless of the fact whether it's possible to ride the wave or not. When I was around 17, 18, and I'd finished school, and I had the dream of becoming a professional surfer. I thought it was possible, and I started working towards it. You know, just working in bars and saving money to do trips. Down the beach at Maroubra, I mean, there's a lot of the older guys at carpet layers, so when you're a kid and you just want a day's work, it wasn't hard to pick up a day's work playing carpet. That's just what happened after high school. I, um, I started to learn how to do the trade and did it for, you know, six or seven years. I was just trying to save my money so we could do trips away and chase those swells that Mark was watching on the maps. 
I knew straight away that I wasn't going to be the next Kelly Slater and win world titles, but I figured out that by being able to forecast where the biggest waves were going to be around the country, I could be the one in the right spot at the right time and possibly make a career out of surfing that way. And that's when I came across this wave in Tasmania. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. And at that point in time, no one in the whole surf industry had seen a wave like that before. The break presented huge challenges, most particularly the infamous double step. The huge volume of water aggressively builds up and suddenly collides on a reef so shallow that in anyone's language it's a recipe for disaster. You know, at the time we surfed some of the biggest barrels ever surfed. It gave us international exposure. I mean, it was after that happened that I really believed that I could make a career out of this. I wanted to make sure Richie had a shot at it as well, instead of, you know, having to lay carpet five days a week. And so often we'll chase a swell somewhere and it just won't be good and, and we'd come back home and then straight away the following week another swell would pop up. And, you know, Richie would have spent all his money he had saved chasing that first swell and you get nothing out of it. You just don't have the heart to see your best mate not be able to go and get the waves on the following swell just because he didn't have the money to. It did drive me, of course, because you know, I wouldn't be there with really him, wanted to jump on the plane, but at the time it used to go down like a box of nails. I just wanted him there with me if I was going to score pump and wave, so it was nothing for me to be able to pay for him to go chase that next swell because he's a hard worker, there's no way he's not going to pay me back. Pretty lucky to have like, a mate like that around you who helps you try and chase your dreams and stuff. <laughs> As a result of Mark's help and their mutual dedication, Richie started to get some of the respect he was looking for. We surfed as hard as we could and we also partied probably harder and the difference between me and Rich is I kept my clothes on and he didn't. He goes back to the old, you won't get nude and as soon as I hear that, I'll be like, yeah, well, watch this. Like, I was not the only one getting nude. There were plenty of occasions where you were the only one getting nude. Yeah, you know, special occasions. <laughs> I can remember the time Rich at a music festival decided to climb 100 foot light tower in the nude in front of about 30,000 people. <laughs> the whole crowd turned around and watched him and he just put on a show for everyone. There was just security guards and police everywhere waiting at the bottom for him. But he somehow managed to evade all the cops and the security guards and vanish off into the crowd. At the height of his partying days, Richie met a beautiful young girl called Lucy. The first time I met Rich, I was at a friend's party at her house and I didn't, pretty much didn't know most people there. I kind of knew most people at the party and then I saw Lucy and I was like, oh, who's that? This little guy with this <laughs> the big head of curls just came up and started chatting away. And I just remember sort of making my way over and she was wearing this little top that said ballerina babe. First thing I said was, hey ballerina babe. That's all I could think. I was just ready to sit on the top. And what I loved about him when the first time that I met him was just he was so charismatic and he was really funny. I took her out to the movies and stuff and asked her out, you know, at a bar and just said, I, I, want, I want to go out with you and he couldn't get it out, but... Yeah, I want to get out with him. No, no silly business. I was like, yes, and he was like, oh. <laughs> and we both kissed and it was a pretty, it was a pretty cute, cute time. Looking back on it, it was really, really <laughs> lovely. Romeo said Judy here. Yeah. Could you take me away from One of Lucy's neighbours had told her mum that Richie was actually hanging out with a bad group of guys and she made it really clear that she didn't want anything going on between Rich and Lucy, particularly because Lucy was only 16 at the time. I think they always had the idea that she was going to meet a nice little Italian Catholic boy, but um, you know, obviously she didn't and she, and she chose me. We were definitely egging him on, but Rich just couldn't help me in the life of the party. We could all tell it was really starting to embarrass Lucy. At the same time, Richie's recognition for surfing and his love for Lucy had another rival. The martial art of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu had come to Australia and Richie quickly became addicted. He surprised himself by winning tournaments from the start. The next logical challenge was mixed martial arts. Because of the UFC frenzy in America, MMA was spreading like wildfire in Australia. Mixed martial arts, or MMA as we all know it, is simply that, it's a mix of all the martial arts out there. This all takes place in an octagon. Most bouts are three five minute rounds. He'll win by submission, whether opponent taps, knockout, or win on points. 
Every aspect of the sport appealed to Richie. It should be said that it also fed the adrenaline junkie in him. I started to get really excited to have my first fight. I was fighting a local guy. He'd been unbeaten. I didn't really know much about it. All I knew was my limited experience in boxing in the, in the backyard and the jiu-jitsu I'd been doing. I was nervous but excited and, and like, you know, really eager at the same time. And the feeling of the whole day that I was walking in the cage and that whole buzz is, is, is pretty amazing. And I wasn't sure how I was going to react. My first fight, I don't know if when the bell went, if I'd freeze or get really nervous and not do anything. <laughs> Like I never pictured like winning that fight the way I did and sort of surprised myself by winning by knockout. Yeah, that feeling was definitely addictive and I just wanted to stick at it and, and do more of it. I was pretty keen to get back in there and have another one and that one had me down in Sydney. He's got that in hand. He ain't letting go of that. He's got a win. I won that one as well, but I won that one with submission and pretty tough of myself. Although Richie had found a new sporting high, the Maroubra surf culture that had created Mark and Richie's dreams now started to destroy them. That aggressive, never back down mentality that we had grown up around was actually giving us the careers we had dreamed of as kids. But we thought that to get the respect from the older guys, we had to be like that out of the water as well. So instead of trying to out-surf our mates, we wanted to out-drink, out-party and out-fight them. And when you mix that aggressive mentality with alcohol, partying and fighting, it's not hard to guess what comes next. I remember coming out of the nightclub, lying drunk. I walked over and ended up getting in a huge punch up with a bunch of guys. So the police came in to break it up. We sort of all fell to the ground. A police officer had jumped on top of me. So I just continued to fight him thinking it was the other guy. And in the midst of a big fight, I put my thumb as far as it would go into the guy's eye socket. I'd been charged with assault, occasionally actually bodily harm on a uniformed police officer. I woke up that next morning and the first thing that I did was head straight to the police station. and. I found the officer that I had assaulted the night before and, and I, I apologised to him. You know, I, I was worried about, you know, going to jail for doing what I did, but I, I seriously, I honestly felt bad about what I'd done because, you know, I'd almost blinded a guy that, you know, I, I didn't even know and I had nothing against and, you know, he had nothing against me. He was just there doing his job and, you know, to think that I came that close to blinding someone, like whether it was the guy that, I was in the fight with over a stupid argument or the police officer, like, you know, either of them didn't deserve to be blinded and, you know, it's a scary thought that I came that close to actually doing that to someone. Six months down the track when I was in court and I was facing, you know, a long jail sentence if I was found guilty, that moment was the scariest thing I've ever been through. The police prosecutor had handed in their witness statements late and they got thrown out of court and for that reason, you know, I was found not guilty and, you know, it was just it was so lucky. You know, I promised myself I'd, you know, I'd never put myself in that situation again, but I was young and stupid and, you know, a month down the track, I, I got blind drunk all over again and I ended up in more trouble. whole corner of my face was just like hanging off like I had my head down and it was just hanging out and when I went like this I put my hand like on the inside of it and just made me feel sick. They put me in an ambulance and you know, they took me up to the hospital. Just been in hospital, got 70 stitches. Oh, the doctor said I was pretty lucky I didn't lose my eye or anything. Yeah, they had to get like a plastic surgery and Fix up a few arteries that have been cut and spray blood. But, um, it's not too bad, you know. Yeah, I'll fucking be surfing again in a couple of weeks. Just having a fucking rough head for the rest of my life. <laughs> what can you do, you know? Someone's fucking doing that to your girl and, yeah, you know, trying to fight your cousin, you know, and fucking just stand there and let him do it, are you? Go for this, um, I don't know, I was real angry after that happened for a long time. Like, all I wanted to do was get the guy back. If, if he had been in front of me in those first, you know, week or two, I don't know what I would have done. Like, I could have ended up killing him when I was that angry. Pretty keen on doing whatever had to be done, you know, like to, to try and get the guy back. And at that age, that's all you want to do, you know, if someone, you know, it's like, glasses your friend, you want to get them back. 
I spoke to my mum about it and I started to learn I didn't need any of this stuff before this incident. And then this happened and she goes, like, this is where you can make a change in your life. You know, you can let your mates go after the guy. But you've got no control over that situation. What happens if they go and beat him up? One of your mates ends up killing him or ends up in jail for doing it. You want that on your head? I thought about it in the end. I would rather just let it go, you know? Looking back on it now, I can see how stupid and dangerous what I was doing was. But when you're young, all you want to do is impress, you know, the older guys and your friends around you. I didn't realise that, you know, I didn't have to do it that way. I mean, if you have to test yourself and your skills as a fighter and you want to prove to everyone that that's what you're good at, then the only place to do that is in a ring against someone who wants to fight you as well. I was a little bit shocked too, like, to, to see Mark react that way and actually think, think the whole matter through so well and, um, and, you know, and come up with that. You know, I'd learn from my mistakes and I could see Rich going through the exact same stuff and it was only going to lead, you know, one place and it was going to get him in a lot of trouble. There was uh, heaps of my mates were going out partying and, um, you know, drugs were going around and I wasn't a fan of the drugs. I'd, but I just find myself just getting super drunk instead, you know, and um, just trying to sort of keep up with everyone and then just make a mess of myself, so. I'd always used to say to him, look, babe, I don't like you doing this. You know, she probably had enough of me going out and carrying on the way I was and, you know, often embarrassing myself, which obviously embarrassed her and just things like that, you know. By the end of it, it's, it started to get really tiresome um, and it put, a, it put a strain on the relationship. She likes to have a good time, but, you know, all in moderation where it, I obviously try to do it, you know, not in moderation. And I don't think I could keep up with him. He was just, just one of those um, just really nutty people. I got there, not to blame it myself really, carrying on. The way things ended, it was quite amicable. We both knew it wasn't working and it was almost like we were growing apart. Commitment was a definite thing, you know what I mean? Like at that age, I think, I think it is for everyone. Um, I was too young to be in a serious relationship and I just didn't know how to handle it, you know? I, I didn't know it was, it was, I was worried about committing or anything like that. I just, I didn't know what it was, I just, you know? I learned, you learn all that later, I guess. I was definitely worried that without Lucy, Richard go way more off the rails than what he was. To get even wilder can end up dangerous. On the weekends, I'd always be out partying, but I never missed a training session through the week. And I knew it wasn't a good mix. I knew if I was to take it serious, things would have to change. But at that time, I just had two wins and I was really confident and I was just really looking forward to my third fight. And Richie Vass in the black shorts, both young men. And plenty of feeling in this one, three fight. That seems to strike up and he's been struck and stopped. It is over. He wins in a record 12 seconds and people start to take notice. His personality makes him a crowd favourite and he starts winning fans. A few weeks later, he goes back to Queensland for a rematch with his first opponent, who had gone on to win several fights undefeated. There we go! Hooked on and hooked on! And there is the tap! Another win keeps his record at an impressive four straight wins with no losses. Promoters start to see him as a draw card. I won four in a row and um, people were saying, oh, he's just a surfer, he's not a real MMA fighter, he's just giving this MMA thing a go, you know what I mean? And, and at, at the start, part of that was true, you know, obviously the more I got involved in it, the more you know, serious about it I got. There's a little bit of buzz around, you know, that he's a surfy kid out there doing pretty good at the MMA and the more opportunities presented themselves. All of a sudden, the opportunity to fight for a world title came about and, um, you know, I, I was stoked and I was still kind of new to the sport, you know, only after the four fights to have that kind of opportunity put in front of me, it was, it was amazing, so... That definitely gave me motivation to really step back and think about the sport and how far I wanted to take it and want to really pursue it. But just when the world title fight was within his grasp, his partying ways finally catch up and his whole world comes crashing to a halt. of January 2008, Richie's mother was greeted with four detectives at her front door. Richie was wanted for an incident that had occurred a few months earlier in Queensland. It was the day of professional surfer Mick Fanning's first world title celebration on the Gold Coast. It had been a terrific win and Rich was proud for his friend as were thousands of his other fans and fellow surfers. That night we all followed onto a pub and the night uh, led on and everyone was pretty much in good spirits and you know we were getting pretty drunk and Ended up just being um, your typical bar argument. The argument started inside the pub and it moved outside. I went outside the pub by myself and there's a bunch of other guys who I was arguing with and that's where the fight started and I got pretty dusted up at the start of the fight and 
Before long, my friends who were there with me came out to help me out and turned into a bit of a brawl and I ended up getting back to my feet and ended up punching the guy who was there in, in amongst the brawl. I know a huge part of why I was sitting there in that cell was because of how drunk I got myself that night and the last thing I want to do is go out and get that drunk and get into the fights, you know, where people get hurt and not only that, I dragged my whole family through it as well, which, you know, I'm pretty ashamed of. It took that situation for me to realise which way I was heading. If I get the opportunity, I just want to show my family, my friends and just everyone just how sorry I am about all this and it's going to be a long nervous wait until it's all over. Arriving from Sydney, handcuffed and escorted by police, Bravo Richard Basulik on his way to a Gold Coast court. Is there anything you'd like to say to the victim? I remember seeing Rich on the news in handcuffs and it just freaked me out. Your heart just sinks. Like, I wanted to know exactly what had happened, you know, what kind of trouble was he in, if it was going to be all right. You know, I was trying to ring him, but obviously he didn't have his phone on and I knew it was going to happen. It was only a matter of time the way it was carrying on. You know, you feel bad that maybe we could have done something more to stop it from happening and then, you know, it was too late now. He was, you know, he was in that trouble. I was actually in bed watching TV one afternoon and I couldn't believe that what I saw. My first reaction was like, oh my gosh, what have you done? She, she knew my mum would be pretty upset, so I literally gave my mum a call and just to see how things were and just to see how I was. Richie turned up for his hearing and was granted bail, but he had to remain living with his mother, hand in his passport and report to the local police station once a week. Until the court case was over, he even had to get special permission from the police if he wanted to go on any surf trips outside of Sydney. In the middle of Rich's court case, he was just so down. I mean, I could tell how much he regretted what he'd done and the position he was in. At that time, I just wanted to help him. I just wanted to get him away from it all and, you know, get him back in the water, take him surfing. It just so happened a huge swell popped up at Shipstones and we were lucky because the only place he could travel to was locally. He couldn't travel internationally. I didn't even want to go, to be honest, when Mark came and grabbed me that day and was like, no, we're going to Tassie this afternoon and just dealing with court and knowing that I had to sort of read my lawyers to say, look, I'm going to go to Tasmania and wasn't too excited on going, but Mark was pretty persistent and saying, it's going to be big, it's going to be pumping, let's go, let's go. You know, that was just the perfect thing to get his mind off what was going on and keep him fit and focused. That's well that we went on to surf ships and it just so happened that it was on the anniversary of Steve Earle, one of Australia's biggest icons, death, and we wanted to do something special to mark that day and one of our good mates brought along a huge blow up croc and he had the idea to get a huge barrel with the crocodile just to pay tribute to everything he'd done for Australia, everything he'd done for wildlife around the world. We just loved his character too, the way he was such a great ambassador for Australia, you know, as he said, he, he loved surfing, he loved MMA. So unexpected and sad to see him go, so I'm sure he would have been looking down and having a laugh at us, you know, going, look at these idiots. I decided to put a helmet with a, with a camera on it to get uh, some point of view footage to show what we get to see when we're pulling into a big barrel at ship stands. This got absolutely smashed. I don't remember anything about the wave, but going back and looking at the footage, the wave was like a, a second wave of the set and it was all just whitewash and bumpy. Even though it wasn't a big wave on the day, I think it would have been pretty shallow at the time. I rolled up in the lip and the lips pushed me into the reef at 100 miles an hour and that's what's knocked me unconscious and busted my helmet. The first thing I remember, and I can still, you know, see this picture pretty vividly, was regaining consciousness underwater and I had no idea where I was, but everything was so silent. Looking up, and all I could see was the surface of the water and the sun coming through all the turbulence and the whitewash. I was sitting there for like 10 or 20 seconds. It was like I was floating in the middle of nowhere. The buoyancy belt I had on was just slowly bringing me to the surface. I didn't even know what was happening. I was just like floating towards the surface of the water. As soon as I, I broke the surface of the water, it was like the pain 
from the injury just hit right at that point. I just had the sharpest pain in my neck, the back of my head, and I felt pins and needles coming down my arms and down my back. I was like, oh God, what have I done? And luckily enough, I had that helmet on because without it, I'm pretty sure I would have died. I was really scared, terrifying, seeing a mate down there unable to move, and there we were in the middle of nowhere. And I was just thinking, I could get home and get out of court, and if things went to go my way, I could be behind bars. And with Mark looking the way he was, you know, there was every chance that Mark wasn't going to be able to surf again as well, so things wouldn't have got any worse for us at that point, both myself and Mark. It was such a great day to just pretty much the last point I've ever been at. It was just non-stop playing over in my head that I'd broken my neck. I was never going to be able to surf again. My career's over. What am I going to do if I can't surf? Saying to myself, that's it, I'm never surfing big waves again. After seeing the footage of the wipeout and the damage caused to his helmet, the doctor told Mark it was a miracle he didn't sustain permanent spinal injuries. What happened was the disc had collapsed on the nerves, which made Mark believe he had broken his neck. The physical rehab was going to be long, but that was bearable. What I wasn't prepared for was what the accident had done to me psychologically. As soon as it became real that I was about to surf the again, that's when I started just having the craziest nightmares. Nightmares about drowning, about breaking my neck, about it happening all over again. Ended up in a wheelchair leading up to that first swell. In my head, I'd already wiped out a hundred times a day, even before I'd even put a foot in the water. It was just exhausting. I'd gotten over all those fears of surfing big waves when I was a a young kid and then it was like that injury just brought it all back and it was like it, it, it brought it into a new light, like just how dangerous what I was doing was. I'm not invincible and it completely wrecked my confidence. I tried everything, no matter what I did, the confidence wasn't coming back. Mark's inability to overcome his fears affected his profile and all of his sponsorships. His contract came to an end and he started to fall off the radar. It was almost like, you know, a pause button had just hit on our lives. To see him now question himself a little bit and confidence or motivation drop, it definitely just rubbed off on me as well. Before he went up for that final day of court, I just wished him all the best and just said, it's going to be over soon. You can put all this behind you after this day, so... And then when he went up there, I was just, you're that worried about which way it's going to swing and you just want to know, you just want to know that it's all going to be good and we can go back to chasing what we were chasing. I'm just glad to see the end of eight months. It's just gone on a long time. I've just got a knot in my stomach and, and I'm not looking forward to going into that court. Better walk down the court now, um, get there, and then I guess in a couple of hours, hopefully, we'll have a result and be nervous, but hopefully it, it comes our way. So. The thought of losing him to go to jail, to, uh, you know, to go to jail for however long, even for a week was um, was really upsetting. I didn't, didn't want it to happen and I, I didn't know if he could cope with it. I couldn't cope with it. Uh, I wasn't sure he could cope with it. Basically, um, we went in, in the courts and uh, the judge saw the night and the case and everything that was put forward for what it was and um, the victim had you know, admitted to drinking all night, being with his friends and he said he wasn't part of the brawl but his friends were and he uh, was witnessing it. He also admitted to watching myself get kicked in the face when I was on the ground. And then he uh, basically said, I got up and then came at him and assaulted him. That moment that when he, he came back and he was about to give that verdict, I was holding my breath because I was scared. I was really scared. And um, I, 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 can't describe, I can't describe it. I'm sorry, I was just so scared. We were all out there on the drink and, you know, a ball erupted and you know, we, we all carried on like a bunch of idiots. And uh, he agreed that, you know, I, I was, you know, in the wrong for hitting the guy, but under the circumstances, he thought it was fair to record no conviction, which at um, you know, the end of the day that means there was nothing recorded against my name, we wouldn't stop me from travelling overseas and uh, pursuing my surfing or fighting career, so... It was like, it was, I just wanted to jump up in the air and shout. My mum, more so than anybody, has been torn up over all this, so 
So to see her smile and realise it's all finished and it's over is just you know, the best feeling. Just really looking forward to putting it all behind us and just getting on with life. Rich came back from that last day in court and there was just like a spark in his eye. Like he was real excited to go out and surf. And at the time I was you know, still terrified of, of surfing anything real big, but his excitement of wanting to chase as well as just rubbed off on me. My mum's really spiritual and she's into a lot of meditation. And I remember reading a book that she had that she'd given me years ago that I never bothered to pick up. For some reason, I just picked it up at that time and it was pretty much life-changing. The book was all about a technique. By questioning your thoughts when they come into your head, you're able to detach from that thought emotionally. Like For me, the emotional component was fear. The thought came into my head that I was going to wipe out in this next well. I was going to break my neck, I was going to drown or something bad was going to happen. The technique was to question my thoughts and you ask yourself three questions. The first question you ask yourself is, is that thought true? I can't know definitely that that's going to happen in the future, so no, that thought in my head, it's not true. The second question is, how does that thought make you feel? It made me feel terrible, it made me anxious, it made me lose my confidence, made me not want to go and surf. And then the final question, this is where the magic happens, who would you be without that thought? Let the thought go, don't think about it. And straight away when you stop thinking about it, that's when you realise that without that thought, my body just felt relaxed. And I, I straight away felt confident and I started to become excited to surf big waves again. The two boys set themselves a mission to be at the top of their game with Mark's eye on the biggest wave of the year prize at the Oakley Big Wave Award. He's crazy. <laughs> oh, I consider him, yeah, definitely top five hellman. Big, gnarly, whatever shit that people look at. I've looked at a lot of his photos and just went, I don't want nothing to do with it. It's crazy. Mark Matthews has ridden the wave of his life at the Monster Energy Pro in Hawaii. The 24-year-old Sydney started threading the thrilling five-meter tubes of the Banzai pipeline to score himself a perfect 10 points. His incredible tube already being described as one of the all-time great North Shore rides. You know, everything I see from him is just charging something big and mutant. And, um, you know, it's a pretty specialised field that does that. You know, there's a lot of guys who will just go and charge big waves, but then there's guys who can surf good too, and surf big waves and small waves, and I think Mark's pretty high on that totem pole. Richie, this crazy little brute. I don't think he has no <laughs> in his vocabulary, you know. He just, he just goes for it. Some of the things that I've seen him go, and I'd be pulling up marlins for sure on some of those waves. He, he goes for it, man. Fuck, he's crazy. He has balls, big balls, and, you know, he might not be the best surfer in the world, but he sure will fucking, he'll go. He'll go on anything. We were like two little kids at Christmas time. We were chasing every swell that popped up. You know, we were having more fun than we'd ever had. And in between swells, we were just doing all kinds of crazy training to help prepare ourselves for every swell that was going to pop up that year. Just trying to push each other, you know. I just wanted to get stronger and, and fitter and more confident. Enthusiasm was definitely back and we were both pretty keen to make up a lost time, I guess, and um, push a bit harder to try and reach what we were trying to do. I couldn't get another sponsor straight away and I just knew I had to maintain that level of exposure. I got all my savings together and I spent that year chasing waves as hard as I could. I had to keep believing that by the end of the year I was going to find another sponsor. After 12 months, both Mark and Richie gained substantial exposure in the surf media and Mark surfed some of the biggest waves he'd surfed to date, including this 20-foot-plus wall of water which was recorded as the biggest wave ridden in Australia for the year. And the winner of the biggest wave ridden in 2008-2009 is Mark Matthews. You know, I got to the final amount of dollars in my savings that won me that award. With Rich's help and with some hard training, I managed to turn around and by the end of the year, I'd turned a year that was the worst year of my life into one of the best. That led straight into a three-year deal with O'Neill. And I was just like going from rock bottom to being back on top. I was on the road all year that year, which pretty much ruined my relationship. It made it really hard to travel. It made, made it hard to leave home because, um, you know, you didn't want to leave them behind. It was really hard for her too if I was always on the road. 
I was so focused at the time, almost to the point of being selfish, but I knew I had to be like that to have that career. She was always second to surfing. I was pretty heartbroken when I, I broke up with my girlfriend, you know, it was, it's pretty hard to take at the time. When we were kids, he didn't really sort of talk too much about his parents splitting, um, he keeps all that kind of personal stuff pretty close to his chest and, and it was the same when he broke up with his girlfriend. He's not kind of guy to cheer off about his personal problems, he just gets on with them and deals with them in his own way. That's quite a long relationship that kind of on end, so I'm sure he was affected by it, you know, I know that I was and me and Lucy broke up after a few years. You know, as sad as I was when we broke up, I just tried to use that and turn it into a positive in the fact that now I had absolutely nothing to be at home for. None of my family lived here in Sydney where I live. I didn't have family to come back here to see, so it's kind of like I'd rather be on the road. The breakup and the end of the relationship did reflect in his surfing to sort of push him to a, another level. It's a very fine line between doing something recklessly dangerous and doing something dangerous but calculated. And then Mark was pretty good at doing the most dangerous things but calculated and often came off with um, surfing the biggest part of the day. Well, I don't think it'll come as a mega surprise to know the biggest slab winner for this year is Mark Matthews. <laughs> I was just so happy to see Mark win that award and it just it just proved everyone his confidence was back. And on top of that, I was given the opportunity to fight for the CFC World Bantamweight title in a few months and, and with the title on the line I just totally focused on putting all my energy in the gym and getting ready for that title fight. Yeah. Mark was well and truly starting to cement his name in the world of big wave surfing but he felt he needed to push the envelope even further. So he decides to spend the whole winter swell season in Hawaii. Richie accompanies Mark to use the trip to further his preparations for his upcoming fight, with the opportunity to train with some world-class fighters. You can see off the rock space cosplays, a community of unity and Oh, is it up there? It looks pretty gnarly. Mark Matthews called me the other morning. Hey, Clark, I'm fucking at the airport. <laughs> I'm coming in. All right. I like Mark. I like surfing with him. He wants it. If it's big, you gotta want it. Because you don't want it, you don't belong out there. Change of environment, change of training partners and trainers, just for that short period of time, you can really just re-energize you and uh, get you really excited about getting back to your home and training with all your, all your trainers. Richie's good, man. He's strong, little guy. He sucks those big waves. He's not afraid of any man, right? A lot of strength and conditioning work and shut me a whole bunch of stuff I didn't seen before and it was really good to have a fresh approach on training. When Rich heard that he was going to be training with BJ Penn, you could just see how excited it made him. And I guess it would be the exact same thing for me to be able to go surfing with Kelly Slater. It was, that's what it was like for him to train with BJ. BJ is one of my you know, all-time favourite fighters. He's not bothered about getting in the ring with anyone. He, you know, he's um, gone up in weight categories and fought you know, guys much bigger than him, which you know, I admire. And he's just such a great fighter to watch. So to actually meet him and have the chance to train with him was great. I definitely think uh, MMA is a, is a good outlet uh, for kids because it teaches them discipline, but it's not like trying to hammer discipline on them, you know, but as, as time goes on, they start to realize, you know, with, with great power becomes great responsibility and raise their self-confidence, give them camaraderie with their training partners, and it's really just a positive thing for the youth everywhere. It's great to see their, their training and what level they're at, but to meet him and realize, you know, that he's, just a, he's a cool guy and just a normal bloke and... It's just like anyone else, you just, you know, chose to dig deep. It makes you realise it's all possible and, you know, if you want it, you can have it. So one minute, one minute.
come in and then we'll just do it probably about six minutes. The guy might be real tired after three minutes, yeah. but I'll keep switching him. Life is about second chances. That's the mark of a man. Everybody can be happy and smiling and happy-go-lucky when everything's going well, but when, when things go bad, you can either you know, give up and, and stay down or, or get back up to your feet. And it's a tough world out there, it's a dangerous world, but you know, you, you gotta keep fighting and you, and you, you gotta keep going, man. That, we all have had our trials and tribulations throughout our lives and you just can't stop, you gotta, you gotta move forward. I'd go off a rock bottom to being, you know, back on top of the world. And Rich was doing well this fight and we just wanted to keep the ball rolling. But there was always just one thing eating away at me. Since the injury, I'd never been back to surf for ship's hands. And it was like, no matter what I did, what, what awards I was winning or what big waves I was riding, it was like ship's hands had got the better of me. I had to get over that fear completely. You know, I had to go back down to ship's hands and surf. At the height of his training, Richie received a personal phone call from Australia. It led to an unexpected reunion. Mainly it's been breaking up for four or five years and we were still friends like when we just bumped into each other, we were still chatting and the odd few occasions that we would give each other a call and talk so, you know, we, we knew we could always call on each other for whatever reasons. Leading up to Richie's title fight, we started to spend a lot of time together. Um, my mum got diagnosed with cancer and um, that killed me to hear that. But it was my fear that, and it's still my fear to this day, that I might lose her. And that's the hardest thing for me to, for me to even comprehend. And I didn't have the coping mechanism or strategies to deal with that situation. But having Rich as a friend, um, he helped me through that. He comforted me, he supported me. No one else had the time or had the want like he did. And I have the utmost respect and thank for him because he really saved me in such an awful time in my life. It surprised me he was there in my time of need and, and he just stepped up to the mark. He's just the most amazing person. I just try to be as supportive as I could and you know, as I said I always thought of Lucy through that time we were together and you know, I consider her a really good friend and I know she's a, a really good person and, and she did the same for me and, and the same for any of her friends so it's just really easy to be there for her and, and help her deal with it because it's not an easy thing to deal with obviously when a family member gets ill with cancer so. I always had feelings for a lot when we were apart, even though it was on unfortunate circumstances, it was nice to start hanging out and um, being there for her, I guess, sort of proved that I still had strong feelings for her. That sort of led into us spending more time together and really enjoying our time together. When we first started going out, I was too young to commit to a proper relationship and I always thought this kind of relationship would be suited if we were both five or, or ten years older, you know, so um, don't know, now that five years has been, we're hanging back out, so it's seemed a lot more possible. Come save me now, come save me now. No, I got there that night, it was pretty packed and I was lucky enough to have the title fight in my backyard you know, at home and I had a lot of friends and family there supporting me and yeah, I was just so excited to get in there that night. I've been wanting to see Rich fight in person, I haven't seen him fight before, I've seen some footage of him fighting. Everything's on the line, you've got all your friends and family in the crowd, the fight's in your backyard and you know, your heroes are in the crowd kind of watch you fight. It's a massive whirlwind of emotions when you're in your backstage. Ladies and gentlemen, the night continues on for the bantamweight CFC world title. Please welcome You spin a wheel in your brain that is hoping that you walk out of the cage and it lands on the right frame of mind and just thinking, you know, why am I even doing this? Like, do I enjoy this? You know, couldn't think of anything worse to be doing right now and fighting for all those people. And then the next breath, I'll be super capable of jumping out of my skin, can't wait to get out of that cage, you know what I mean? Bouncing around, it's a crazy experience. Rich had only had a handful of fights before that world title match. You know, it was a huge stepping stone. He never faced an opponent that good, but at the time there was no one in the country that wanted to fight Rich because he'd been beating everyone so easily that he really had to step up. Most fighters in his position, there's no way that early in their career they'd take a fight like that. But Rich just wanted that title and he wanted it now. As this is a title fight, instead of the usual three five-minute rounds, 
This one is scheduled for five five minute rounds. It's a tall order to go the distance and requires superhuman endurance. The first round started off well. I was stuck to the game plan and I felt you know, my striking was working well and I was able to keep him on his feet. We got sort of into a clinch and he, he landed a good knee. We sort of buckled my knees and we ended up going to the ground. Oh, oh, Bass again, looking in. Oh, big knee by Bass Wally. My opponent, he was you know, very experienced and he was a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt. So you know, on the ground, he's very strength lay. It was a tough round, but there were four more to go. That's why moving, looking for Yama. Oh, yeah, has he got it? Has he got it? Holding on for dear life, Richie Bass looking to escape. And he has! And he has! How soon? How soon? Richie's opponent had him in the dreaded arm bar lock. A circumstance where the fighter will often tap out in order for his arm not to break. But to tap out is to lose the bout. I just thought, you know, the fight's over, he has to tap out, he can't possibly get out of that. I thought he was going to break his arm for sure, because it didn't look like Rich was going to tap, and I was going, dude, what's he, I'm going to sit here and watch this guy's arm break right now. One thing I learned, surfing big waves, if you do find yourself in a bad situation around the water, if you panic, it's just going to make things much worse, and pretty much the same when you're in the cage, and you do got to stay calm and just think, you know, what you got to do to get yourself out of it. This is the, the occasion you've been preparing for for, you know, for a long time and you're not just going to have that opportunity of getting that bill around your waist sort of slip by just by tapping. So um, I was just going to give it you know, everything I could to try and escape the situation. Richie's determination not to give up and tap out is as bewildering as it was miraculous. You are elastic, man! I don't know if the guy knew he was gonna break the arm or what. He just got a little slack for a second or whatever, but Rich just like bent out of the thing somehow and it's pretty crazy. He's gonna last no matter what happens. I was grateful to get out of the armbar, obviously, but I was kind of dirty for even letting myself get in that situation. And I have to, you know, make it hard for myself to get out of it and, you know, and continue on the fight. Is it the third and starts with a great long right hand? I was still standing able to try and throw punches into the last round. But then again, um, I felt fatigued and uh, probably a little bit more tired than I would have liked. Richie Bass needs a submission or a knockout. It's only a very tough round for him. Richie Bass, they have gone the distance. After getting almost knocked out in the first round and then withstanding an armbar and five five minute rounds, it's not in his nature to give up and he just pushed through and he gained a lot of respect from the crowd and from the guys fine. He's got a character where he just, it's not an option to fail. He wants to succeed, he needs to succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, after five rounds match, we went to the tenth of school rounds, we have a decision, can you I ended up getting beat on points. Yeah, I was gutted. I didn't even think about losing in preparation for the fight. I just felt so confident. And, you know, but then again, it was no push over. It was a really experienced fighter, so I, I had plenty of positives to take out of it. He came up to all of us and, and he was like apologising for letting us down. He trained as hard as he could and he fought as hard as he could and he, he didn't leave anything behind. And you know, you're not letting anyone down when you give it your all like that. I was, you know, I was pretty emotional not winning the fight, but having Lucy there and um, realising that I was lost and it's still pretty lucky anyway, so I was still pretty happy with my life. This time we'll start things over. He came up to me and told me he loved me. I think he wanted to show his his love and also his appreciation for, for my support that I'd given to him leading up to that point. Me and Lucy were pretty serious before the title fight. I hadn't really made it official or anything like that. We knew where we were at. I came about to say, you know, yeah, um, Let's do this, let's, let's go out and um, let's give it a go. And yeah, it so happened that he, he posted his relationship status on Facebook the next day. The next day I was put up there with a fish, you know, that I'm in a relationship with her, so 
it'll be a great opportunity to put it up and people have heard that yeah, I wanted to give another proper crack. But that's as official as it gets these days. Like, you can like hide your wedding ring, but you can't really hide your relationship status on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> so shit. Soon after Richie's title fight, a huge file popped up in Tassie and straight away, you know, the nerves just started to kick in. having to say to myself, if I can overcome this fear, then nothing's going to scare me. Mark can accept it since his neck injury, so going back, you know, it was a lot of excitement, but still a little element of unease. Kelly Slater was actually in Australia, and he had been my hero ever since I was a young kid growing up. Last week I talked to Mark a lot, and, and um, I've been wanting to get down to ship for a while. I was nervous enough, but on top of that I also had my all-time surfing hero in Kelly Slater. I had Cabby Abaddon, the guy that made my career possible from a young age. And then I had my best friends in Rich. It felt like the whole world was watching what I was going to do. It was probably the most nervous I've ever been in the surf, you know, I had full on butterflies in my stomach. Having Rich there at that moment gave me that little edge of confidence, you know, we'd been pushing each other our whole life to surf bigger and crazier waves and having him being the one there to tow me in, it was just, he had my back, if I was going to wipe out he was going to be there and I could see that he had the confidence in me that I was going to be able to do this. If I could bet like any part in getting his confidence back and, and then seeing him surf those waves again, I'd do anything. I just wanted straight away, first wave, no matter what, I wanted a big one. The only thing that was going to get me over the fears was getting a proper huge wave. I guess you got to be careful what you wish for because one of the biggest waves I'd seen popped up, you know, 10 minutes later and um, it was my turn. I was a little bit like, all right, this big one coming, you want the next big one? I just had to go, I had to do it. No matter what the wave was going to do, I was going to. As I hit the wave service, I'd fall. I just went, all right, this is it. This is the wipeout, you know, you're gonna have to get through. I was a little bit worried because of the, you know, the history in, in his previous wipeout down there, being his first wave of the trip. It was a massive one, and, and those massive ones, they can do all sorts of things down there, so. The wave just drew me up into the lip. It feels like you're airborne underwater. And I was just like, it's just that sort of one or two seconds of floating, you know what's about to happen, and then all of a sudden it just goes BOOM! Like the craziest loud noise just smashes you into the water and you know the turbulence is just trying to rip your limbs off your body like my arms were going everywhere and I was just tucking up and I was just like please don't hit the bottom, please don't hit the bottom. I just remember rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. All of a sudden it just stopped and let me go. 
I was just like, what? Just one stroke, two strokes. I was up, the wave was over, and I was just like, I've done it. I've never felt happier in my life, you know. You got a pretty good beating, but uh, he just put all the smiles, you know. I was pretty keen jumping the rope again. As soon as you handle a wipeout that big in a wave, you're like, all right, I'm, I'm back. I was ready to take on anything after that. That was like a, a great relief, and uh, if there was any concerns about surfing shippies again, they were definitely gone. Mark was finding that passion and that desire to surf your ways again by going down the ship turns and surfing again. And, and that's exactly what I wanted to do with my fighting. I wanted to get back in there and prove to myself and prove to everyone who was there to support me that I, I was better than that last performance. After the loss, I was trying to be positive and remain upbeat, but you know, I still just couldn't get out of the fact that I felt like I blew it. Going away with Kelly shortly after it, going to surf Sipstons. He's obviously been through so much in his career, ups and downs, and he just shed a new light on it, you know, not to worry. He kind of put it in perspective for me and um, just made me feel better about the situation. You know, I, honestly, I would probably argue that having that loss with Danny was the best thing to ever have in my career. And it's, you know, I think if you look at, at anyone's uh, stories of their lives, any person, you know, it's in real sort of deep despair or a bad loss or, you know, something seemingly terrible happens in your life where you can find what life's about, you know, and why you do what you do. You know, for me, it was it was to re-energize what I do and, and find, like, a new life in it. You know, for Richie, that could be, it could be the same, it could be something different, you know, it's really how you take it and what you learn from when you lose. Ten times world champion now and one of the best athletes that, you know, there ever was, so if he can give you any advice on, on how to deal with loss and how to remain positive, uh, yeah, you're gonna listen. I can understand being devastated, you know, he, he had a perfect record till then, but everybody loses, you know, that's just part of life. It's just really having um, your mind open enough to accept that maybe that's a good thing. Not to be okay with, like, going out there and losing every time, you know, but to be okay with that you have already lost, just process it, get through it, learn from it. You don't learn until you, you're shown something. You know, even from a little kid, you can't expect to get up and run when you come out of the womb, you know? So we gotta help you out, you know, it takes a while. So, you know, we're all just in different places, trying to, uh, learn more and more. I had dreams of fighting the UFC and, and make it to the global stage, so if I didn't win this next fight, my dreams and my goals of fighting on those massive stages, it would seem more distant. It's important to get a, a win and keep those dreams alive, I guess. I was Straight away, we got in there, and I, I worked for the cleans, got the cleans and ended up taking to the ground. When Rich got his back, you could see that he had him in a good position, he was choking him. I'm just that nervous, I was just going, tap, 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 please tap. trying to take MMA seriously and become a professional athlete has definitely introduced things into my life like discipline and dedication that have made me grow up and matured me which I don't know where I would have got them from had I not have got involved in the sport so definitely that helped mould me to the person I am today. Definitely helped me resurrect my relation with Lucy and just really appreciate if it wasn't for my friends around me and Lucy things would have been different so I'm pretty happy with I are. He's obviously matured a lot. He's gone through a lot. Those pitfalls that he had in his life has obviously changed him as a person. But the relationship now is different in the sense that it's a relationship based on a big foundation of friendship. I don't reckon there's any way either of us on our own would have gotten to where we are now. To have been able to help each other out and through the ups and the downs and to be where we are now, it's a good feeling. We've developed such a strong mateship over the last couple of years with everything that's happened. It's just unreal to celebrate these moments together.
I want to keep chasing the biggest waves around the world and find the biggest shows in the world. My dream is to one day be in the UFC and, and be on shows of that caliber. And after years of getting things wrong, I'm finally trying to understand what has to be done to, you know, to reach that level and become a professional athlete and do the right thing. So you know, I don't have any plans. I'm giving up one for the other. I believe I can really push both as far as I can go. And the goal is to be on the world stage in both sports. My dreams are just to enjoy what I'm doing for the next five years. Like, as amazing as it is being a professional surfer, it's still easy to get complacent and find everything negative about it, the travel and being away from home. I see parts of Richie and Lucy's relationship that I really do want companionship, always having someone like that there for you to rely on. But for me, just the way I'm travelling and stuff at the moment, I don't know what the future will hold, I don't know what sort of people I'll meet down the track, but I'm so happy just with the friends and the family that I've got that, you know, at the moment I don't feel like I need to have that other one strong relationship. I'd rather just spend my time with my family and my friends and my career. And definitely in the next five, ten years, I'd love to have kids, I can't wait, but I don't think I'll be risking my life the way I do when I have kids. It'll just it'd be selfish. We had such an amazing two or three years, so we wanted to celebrate, but you know, in the past we'd gone out and celebrate on the drink and had a, an all night drinking session and then end up in trouble. So we just wanted to do it differently and there couldn't be a better way than spending the whole night instead of in a nightclub drinking out surfing our favorite wave in the world. Mark always believed it was possible, you know, surfing hours at night, surfing hours at night. Surfing hours at night. We had gotten our careers in a place where we could actually afford what it would cost and put all these massive lights in place, get the insurance, get the permits, get everything together and, and pull up something that was just a dream in the past. People were advising us against it for all sorts of reasons, but it pretty much made our decision and we had the confidence we could pull it off, so sometimes it's going back yourself, I guess. Ours is the most dangerous wave in the world, size for size, and the waves at the opening of Botany Bay, so the big swell lines charging out of deep water, they fold over themselves pitch onto this reef ledge that's only one or two feet deep. Below that is just razor blade barnacles. And then 10 feet down the line from that is a cliff face. So if you don't hit the bottom, get cut on the barnacles, you'll get smashed in the cliff. You know, there's been crazy cuts from the rocks. I dislocated my hip out there once. Burst eardrums, there's been broken neck. There's so many risks, but the rewards when you make a wave like that, make it all worthwhile. I get nervous and scared, you know, coming out there, yeah, in the middle of the day. To be out there in you know, pitch black, the adrenaline's pumping and the fear factor's there, but it's all there, so you help you switch on and try and do your best. You know, doing all that in the day is hard, and, but you can pull it off, but doing it in the night was just something else. Nobody sleep, nobody get hurt. 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 The madness flash begins on the road to anywhere. On the road to anywhere. Nobody get hurt. Nobody's
through the entire night. It was unreal to be a part of and definitely something you'll remember forever. It was just surreal to end the surf as the sun was coming up. You know, this way we got to go on a surfing bender. You know, I don't know what's going to happen next. I guess anything's impossible. Everything's impossible. Don't, don't bother about doing anything. Uh. <laughs> I'm not even trying, <laughs> seriously. <laughs>